Good? Hey there, I'm Lisa Bronner, and I'm here a few minutes before one to welcome those of you who are also early. This is my second Facebook Live in a series called Experiments in Soap. And we're going to be looking at some of the great um, abilities of soap by doing some pretty nifty experiments. So I want to welcome you if you've already joined in. I appreciate your coming. And uh, we're going to give a few minutes before I jump into the content. So before we do that, uh, I just wanted to say a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm Lisa Bronner. I'm part of the Bronner family that runs Dr. Bronner's soaps. Soaps is what we're mostly known for, but we make lots of other products too. And so um, part of my role is to educate on low-tox living and how to welcome greener cleaners into their home. But also I love to talk about soap. And so I really welcome you all here today. All right, I've given a couple minutes for people to join in. So I'm going to start with today's topic. So once again, I'm Lisa Bronner. I write the blog Going Green with the Bronner Mom, and I run this Facebook page. Now today helping me are a couple assistants I want to thank. Uh, first off, my son is running our camera today, my production assistant, because as you know, we're all working from our homes these days. I also have my cousin Daniel standing by. He is uh, in outside of Milwaukee, but he is ready to answer your questions. So if you have any questions about anything I talk about or a uh, demonstration or experiment that, that I do or any question at all, we'll do our best to answer. Uh, Daniel's background is in chemistry and math, so he's ready to take that on. He did a great job with our previous session last week. Now, if you missed our session last week, we looked at soap's ability to break surface tension, uh, which helps it uh, helps water go down to the surface we want to clean. If you missed that, you can find that on my Facebook page and you can watch it uh, afterwards. And you could do the, the demonstrations and experiments right along with me. Today, we're going to dive even deeper into soap chemistry. And we got some kind of big words, but really cool things. So the soap chemistry we're going to look at today is um, the amphiphilic nature of soap. Now that's a crazy word, but basically what it means is that soap has two sides that are opposite that join together. And so we're going to look at that. Now, this is my ideal thing to do. I love to teach and I love to dive into soap. I think soap is fascinating. It's a good thing since I work with it. Um, but I also have a background in teaching. I used to teach high school. So this is like the perfect intersection of both of those realms of my life. So today we're going to examine that molecule called soap. Soap is really special. Now last week I also talked about how soap is really old. It was kind of developed or discovered or observed somewhat accidentally. Uh, and you can that explanation in the previous live. So to help us understand a soap molecule, I want to talk about how it's formed. Now, soap is made of two things, oil or fat and an alkali. Now, those are big words, but I'm going to break them. Now, I have some handy dandy tinker toys here that uh, I've formed to make. What does that look like if I put it this way? It looks like a letter E, right? This is a model of a fat molecule or an oil molecule. The fancy word for them is triglyceride. And what that means is there are three tri, like tricycle, tri, one, two, three, fatty acids, three fatty acids attached to a glycerin backbone. So we have a triglyceride, and it looks like a letter E. So this is an oil molecule. It's the first thing that's needed in order to make soap. It could be vegetable oil, like olive oil or coconut oil. It could be an animal fat, like tallow or lanolin, uh, it even could be um, a petrochemical oil. So that's the first thing you need. The second thing you need, and I've also made this out of Tinker Toys, is a strong alkali. Alkali is the opposite of an acid. We're kind of used to the term acid. I don't know why alkali didn't catch on either. Um, they have, well, it's kind of the exact opposite. So an alkali is, uh, we have a really strong one. And this alkali can be sodium, hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is commonly called lye, and you hear about that even if you're reading um, books a long time ago about people who made their own soap. Even today, people who make their own soap use lye or sodium hydroxide. Now listen to that word, sodium hydroxide. You have sodium, which is 
uh, an element, and that's represented by our yellow ball tinker toy, and you have hydroxide. Now, do you hear hydra, hydrogen, oxide, oxygen? You have hydrogen and oxygen connect to a sodium, uh, sodium uh, atom. So, when you take these two together, your oil molecule and your alkali, and you put them together, they break each other up. So fortunately, I'm using Tinker Toys, they break each other up. The uh, fatty acids come off the glycerin, the sodium comes off the alkali, they're all free floating, and then they reattach. And that fatty acid attaches to the sodium. And I have some more sodiums because you know we had three fatty acids, so we end up with three soap molecules, the sodium and the fatty acid. We end up with our glycerin backbone, which just stays put as glycerin. You might have heard of glycerin. It's a common ingredient in personal care products. Some people even use glycerin just by itself as like a, a, a skin moisturizer. And then you have the hydroxide, the, the oxygen, hydrogen, and that's going to form with other hydroxides to make water which is two hydrogens and an oxygen. So that is soap. You have two things that go in, oil and alkali, three things that come out. Soap, which is this sodium, fatty acid, glycerin, and water. Cool. So this is how we end up with our soap molecule. Now, yeah, you're looking at this and you're like, well, soap molecule doesn't really look like a tinker toy, does it? Well, it kind of does. It has a head and it has a tail. And this is where the funny nature of soap comes in. Soap has two opposite ends, and they have uh, pretty different characteristics. So this sodium on this end has a positive charge. You know about charge with like electricity, negative, that sort of thing? Sodium has a positive charge. This tail doesn't have a charge at all. Now the funny words are polar, meaning it has a charge, and nonpolar, it doesn't have a charge. Uh, and the reason that is important is because different things are drawn to different sides of this molecule. Some things are going to be drawn to this side, and some things are going to be drawn to this side. And that is what makes soap super special. Most molecules just have one charge or no charge, but they don't have the both going on. Now, the, the fancy word for that, I used it a moment, moment ago, is amphiphilic. Wow, you're learning Greek today, amphiphilic. What that means, ampha means both, meaning it has both things going on, the polar and the nonpolar. Philic means love. What? Both loving. It means that it loves two different things. This side is going to love some things that are attracted to the positive, and this side is going to love some things that are attracted to the fact that it has no charge. So what those some things are is the thing that's attracted to the lack of charge is more oil. And if you think about soap, what do we want it to do? We want it to clean oil and grime, that sort of thing. This end of it is what is attracted to that oil. This end, on the other hand, is attracted to water. And so the, the water is going to be drawn to this side of a soap molecule. The oil is going to be drawn to this side. Now, it doesn't stop there. Soap does something even more interesting. And in this explanation, I'm going to use some lovely Play-Doh. This Play-Doh, can you see it? Nice murky color here. This Play-Doh represents oil or grime or whatever it is you're trying to clean. All right? So soap molecule and some oil, and that soap end is going to be attracted to that. But it doesn't stop there because lots of soap want a piece of this grime. And so as many soap molecules are around start flying towards this grime, and they all want a piece of it. And so they each stick their fatty acid end into the grime. And you know what? There's not even enough space on this. So they break that grime up to smaller bits so that more soap can get into the grime, and the soap just attaches itself all the way around. And it forms a bit of a shield. Can you see that? So eventually, this shield forms all the way around the grime, and it 
kind of ends up looking like a really big ball or a sphere. And that ball has a special name. It's called a micelle. What a micelle is, is a bit of grime in the middle surrounded by soap. So if you can picture all of this surrounding the grime in a big ball, and then what happens is the water comes by, and normally water doesn't like oil, right? But water comes by and it can't see the oil because the oil's hiding inside. And so the water just sees this end of the soap molecule and it loves this end because it's got that nice positive charge and it swoops it up and it carries it away. So if you don't believe me, let me show you another way to look at this. So I have here in this jar some water and oil. Now I had my daughter color it so that you could see it better. The bottom is water and it's colored purple and the top is oil, which it's olive oil so it's a little green. Now water and oil separate. Looks like, you know, salad dressing. Well, maybe not the purple part, but it looks kind of like salad dressing. If I were to shake this, it blends for a little bit, but after just a few minutes it goes right back to being in two pretty distinct layers. Well, what happens if I add some soap? What happens if I add some soap in there and shake it up? What does that do to our layers? So I've got a lot of oil in there, so I'm going to add a lot of soap. It's not usually the amount of oil you're cleaning off your hands. Now if I shake it up, whoa, look at that. Look at that. The soap uh, has made the oil and water stick together because it has that ability to grab both at the same time. So that is the power of soap in action. Now, that's not what I promised to show you. If you saw my promotions, you saw something that I called kaleidoscopic soap. So what's that all about? Now we've been looking at these big models. Uh, of a molecule, but molecules are not that big. Molecules are teeny tiny, we cannot see them. And so we're gonna do a demonstration here, and if you got your supplies, you can do it right here with me. We're gonna do a demonstration where you can't see the molecules, but you're gonna see evidence of them, kind of like the wind. We don't see it, but we see evidence of it. So what, I'm, what I want you to do is if you have a plate, go ahead and put the plate right in front of you, and if you had some Milk, it could be dairy milk or non-dairy, but it needed to have some fat content. Go ahead and pour that into the plate. All right. Now, uh, you've got your milk in your plate. Now I'm gonna have you some food coloring. Now with the food coloring, I want you to put some drops in like a circle around the middle of the plate but don't let the food coloring touch each other. So I've chosen some purple and some blue and some green. Okay, so I'm gonna have, are we zoomed in there on the All right, now we're gonna take some soap and you can use a Q-tip for this. I'm gonna take some soap on the end of our Q-tip and we're gonna put it right in the middle. Just, to, just touching it and see what happens. Ooh, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, now, those of you who watch, are gonna say, oh, but that's just surface tension. We saw that last week. But it's not just surface tension. Surface tension is at play here. You are seeing surface tension. However, there's something more. Do you see that not all the food coloring plate, just what was on the surface, and that the stuff that was underneath the surface is actually being drawn back? Are we, are we nice and close on, on, the, on the plate, Nate? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, here's another difference from my demonstration last week. Last week we talked about surface tension, and you can only pop surface tension once, and then the surface tension is popped. But with this, we're drawing the soap back to the, I'm sorry, we're drawing the food coloring back to the soap. It's not actually the food coloring that's coming back. It's actually the oil in the milk, the fat in the milk that's racing towards the soap and drawing the food coloring with it. So the food coloring is just like getting knocked around by the fat that's coming back towards the soap. Now, 
point, it really slows down because uh, things are going to move a little more closely. If I started shaking the plate, I would make a mess, but the fat molecules move more. Now, that is a pretty cool design I've got here. And I mentioned to you, you might want to have your camera ready because that's such a cool design. Now, what I did here, Nate, can you come back up to me? All right, what I did here, this is a demonstration. It's a demonstration because I knew exactly what was going to happen. I've done it before many times. I love it. It's just one of those things I enjoy doing. Um, I knew that was going to happen. And so that is a demonstration. That's not an experiment. An experiment requires me to ask questions, questions I don't know the answer to. So I intentionally did not do what I'm about to do so that we could do it all together here. We're going to ask some questions and see what different So this happened to be 2% dairy milk, so 2% fat content, uh, and, and then the food coloring. What happens if I use a liquid with a different fat content? What happens if um, I use you know, different colors of food coloring? What happens if you use a different type of soap? Uh, and so these are all questions that we can ask, and then, then we're doing an experiment because we're trying to find out the answer. So I'm going to put this to the side. See, even as I move it, the colors are swirling. It's so neat, though. Could you grab me some salsuds? Okay, so we're going to do a couple more things here. I've got a couple. Now, this is an experiment. And you can guess what's going to happen. In fact, if you want to put your guesses in the comments, um, you can go ahead and do that. Remember, Daniel's standing by to answer your questions. So if you have any questions about what's happening uh, or anything else, go ahead and the comments and answer them. Uh, so I'm going to try this with a couple different liquids. Hold on. Here we go. All right. And some salsa. All right. Now this is water. Is there any fat content in water? No. All right, so what happens if we try this experiment with just water? So that's going to be one of my plates. And then another thing I'm going to experiment with, this is almond milk. So almond milk has some fat content, natural oils in, uh, in almonds. So I'm going to try this one here. We'll see what happens there. And lastly, I have heavy whipping cream. Now, this is as high a fat content as I can get. So we're going to try that one here. Uh, yeah, just a sec. Just a sec. Um, OK, so now the fun thing here is that you can do different colors, uh, different, you know, uh, to try. I've, uh, I think I'll do one with just um, green and purple, because that's kind of a cool Mardi Gras. I'll put that in the water. See what happens there. Okay, now, as I said, we're asking questions we don't know the answers to. We can make guesses. And in the scientific process, we call that guess a hypothesis. So I'm going to make a guess. I'm going to make a guess that with the water, it's going to spread to the edges because I'm going to break the surface tension. But beyond that, it's not going to do anything else. I don't think you're going to see the colors coming back to the middle because there's no fat content in water. So that's my guess for the water. The heavy whipping cream, uh, let's see. Let's do green and blue. Um, that one, that's a tricky one because there's a high fat content. So is that fat content going to move back to the middle? Or is so much fat that it's going to take up the soap right away and there's not going to be any more draw because the soap's kind of going to get used up. I'm not sure what's going to happen there. Uh, and with the almond milk, I think it's going to be pretty much like the, the first thing I did, the 2%. All right. Okay, so let's see. I've got my Q-tip. Can we see all the, all the boards here? Just as it is. Okay, what happens if I put soap in the water? Okay. Okay, I saw the, the food coloring that was still on the top went to the side. But what I see happen is that a lot of the food coloring actually sank to the bottom of the plate, probably because the density of the food coloring is higher than the water, 
and it's not moving. There is no swirly action happening here, no kaleidoscope, and that is because there's no fat in the water, so it's not being drawn to the soap to mix around like our first plate did. So that, that is what, kind of what I expected there. Okay, so then second, let's try the almond milk. And if you have a different guess than me, go ahead and put it in the comment section. My guess as it was that it would do similar to what the 2% did. I think it's a, a pretty similar um, consistency, but I could be wrong. Oh, oh, this is interesting. This is interesting. All right, it's moving, but it's not moving fast. Can we zoom on that anymore? It's moving, but not very fast. If we left this here for a few minutes and then came back, we would probably see more movement. So there is some swirling action, but not a whole lot. Okay, I'm gonna ask another question. What happens if I put a lot of soap right there in the middle? What happens if I don't just use a Q-tip? What happens if I actually put several drops of soap? Does that do anything? Not at first. Okay, we found out something. Almond milk doesn't cause that same swirly reaction. All right, I'm gonna leave that there though because I wonder if over time that'll move. Last one, the heavy whipping cream. Super high fat content. Let's find out. Let's find out. All right, now you may not be able to see this, but I can see through the reflection that there's a, a circle here pushing everything out and that food coloring that must have been down on the bottom like it was in the water is now being pulled up. It's a slower reaction than that one, but I think it's lasting a much longer time. Wow. It is, it is really going. Can we, can we get even closer? Like, could you bring the camera, like, just move it? It's hard to get up there. Oh, it is? It is? Okay, that's great. You know what? I think this could use some, so some more soap, because as I said, the fat's probably grabbing onto all that soap that's there. You know, sometimes when you're washing a really dirty pan, you need to get more soap. I think I need a little more soap in this situation. I'm going to put some more soap in there and see what happens. Now, a couple things we noticed. It did not reach the edge of the plate, not like my first one did. However, I would say there's actually more action happening here in the middle. It's still moving. It's still moving. Okay, we're going to wait on this one because it's got some, some things to do. Let's come back and look at the almond milk again. Can, can we see it? All right, awesome. Look, the almond milk has had some action too. All right, you have some more movement. And what I, I think happened is that we had the surface tension that broke, but a lot more slowly than it broke on the milk. And so that ended up pushing uh, towards the border of the plate. Um, but there isn't the swirling action that indicates the, the fat coming back to the soap. So my guess is that the fat content of the almond milk is just not as high as the 2%. And that's why you don't have that action there. That's my guess. Uh, however, I am going to defer to Daniel if he happens to know. If you have a different Daniel, go ahead and put that in the comment section for everyone to see. And then I come back here to the heavy whipping cream. As I said, this is like a super slow reaction, but there is more stuff happening here. It's still moving very, very slowly, but it honestly looks super, super cool. I'm wondering if I can speed this up with a different different uh, surfactant. Now last week we learned that soap is a, is, is a surfactant. It's part of a bigger category of things. All detergents are also surfactants. Anything that has that ability to clean. So I'm going to use some sal suds. Now sal suds is another Dr. Bronner's product. It's actually a non-toxic detergent and it's a little bit more concentrated than the soap. So what happens if I put that in here? Is that going to cause faster action? It's moving. There's action, but it's not all that fast. Still, still. Okay. 
All right, I'm going to keep looking at that, but it might not be that fascinating for you to look at with me. If you have a chance, go do this with heavy whipping cream. I would say that that is the most interesting of, of all of these, as long as you have the patience to look at it. All right, which one? Okay, all right. So my son's pointing out the water is done a little bit more as it's just sat here. Interesting, we have a soap in the middle. That's probably the soap um, spreading out along the, along the bottom. And the food color is spread out on the bottom of the plate, but still indicating that there's, there's no fat content in there. All right, so that's pretty cool. Now, if we can come back up to me. So how, oh, let me know when, when, when you, okay, yeah, okay, super. So what does all this have to do with cleaning? I mean, this is pretty often do you need to put, you know, milk on a plate. What this is, is showing is that attraction between oil and fat and the fact that oil and water blend together. You remember we, we had our, our jar that showed the two of them. This means that when you, when you wash something, whether we're talking your hands, a counter, a piece of laundry, it's the soap that is able to grab onto that grime and grab onto the water. The water by itself can't do it. Uh, and so what we have here, I'm going to go back to my fancy Tinker Toy My Cell. What we have here is, uh, is we want to create these My Cells every time we wash, whether we're washing our hands or the counter or the laundry or whatever, the dishes. Uh, and so we want to create these My Cells. How does it work? How can we help it? Well, number one is um, to scrub our hands or scrub the surface. That allows the soap to move around, to move around, to get on the full side of the My I didn't prepare enough uh, soap molecules here, but ideally a micelle would be completely surrounded. So scrubbing, the, just the action of moving the soap around lets the soap get all the way around the pieces of grime. It breaks them up into small bits and it carries them away. It can lift them off of surfaces, whether it's your hands or fabrics or whatever. So scrubbing is important. Second is time. You got to give the soap time to get itself arranged like this. It just doesn't do it like that. It needs a little bit of time to wiggle itself all the way around. And that's why uh, you need to give your hands some time and give surfaces some time when you're cleaning. It gives the soap time to work. So scrubbing in time. Uh, and then the third key thing is rinsing. Because even this isn't clean if it's just sitting you know, on your hands or on, on your fabrics. You've got to rinse it out. Soap is not a, a you know, squirt and go thing. It's not a waterless thing. It needs the water to come by and swoop up, grab onto these soap molecules, and take it all away. So scrubbing, time, and uh, rinsing, all important there. Now, you're like, OK, but we don't like, really often have to wash Play-Doh. Uh, and I really you know, don't often have oil on my hands. But you actually do, because oils are all around us. There's oils in dirt. There's oils uh, that we naturally um, come out of our skin to keep our skin moist, but then they get kind of left over. We want them off our hands. And even germs have oil, and that is how soap works against them. Uh, many germs are called a lipid layer, and that lipid is kind of a, another word for fat, and soap, that end of soap, is attracted to it. So when we wash our hands or surfaces or whatever with soap, the soap is still going to grab that lipid layer and take it away, which is how soap is effective and why it's still the number one recommended way to keep ourselves clean and healthy. So soap is really an amazing thing. We have that soap molecule that can grab and grab. I call it the great peacemaker because it makes things that don't get along want to get along like oil and water, and it takes them all away. There are very few molecules that exist that have that amazing ability. So I hope that that's been interesting. I hope you something. I hope you have greater confidence in soap. If you have any more questions, you can leave them in the comments afterwards. I'll definitely see them. Next week, we're going to make something really fun. Uh, I call the session, How Do Elephants Brush Their Teeth? So you definitely want to join me to answer that question. And we're going to look at another uh, ability of soap and what it can do and, and how that helps us. So join me next Wednesday, or if you're not seeing this live, just look for, look for the third session of my series, Experiments in Soap. Once again, I'm Lisa.
honor. I have the blog Going Green with a Bronner Mom, and I thank you for joining me.